Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. If you like this podcast, you will love my new anthology called Moms Don't Have Time to Have Kids. Check it out, and you'll hear from 49 authors about all sorts of things moms don't have time to do. All the authors have been on this podcast. Also, check out my TikTok, at with Zibby and Tracy, my other podcast, Sex Talk with Zibby and Tracy. Check out Moms Don't Have Time to Write on Medium. And of course, my new publishing company called Zibby Books. And now back to our daily author interview site and a quick hello from some of my kids. Hi. Hi. Hello. Enjoy the show. Nikki May is the author of Wahala, a novel. Born in Bristol and raised in Lagos, Nikki May is Anglo-Nigerian. At 20, she dropped out of medical school, moved to London, and began a career in advertising, going on to run a successful agency. Her debut novel, Wahala, was inspired by a long lunch with friends. It's published around the world and due to be turned into a major TV series. Nikki lives in Dorset with her husband and two standard schnauzers. Welcome, Nikki. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss Wahala. Thanks for having me, Zippy. Oh, I love that cover. I still have the galley, but this is one of my favorite colors, so I'm very excited about it. Hot pink. Hot pink. Gotta love it. Okay. Would you mind telling everybody listening what your book is about? And then I want to know what inspired you to write it. What, why this story? It's my debut novel. It's called Wahala, and other people are describing it as sex in the city with a killer twist. And I'll take that. It's a modern, <laughs> it's a modern subversive take on friendship, family, and culture, but it's underpinned by this rather epic revenge twist. Excellent. Okay. Debut novel. How did we, wait, just go back in time first. How did we get right here? Like, where did you, did you always like to write? How did you end up writing your debut novel now? I've always written, whether it was angst-ridden, terrible poetry as a spotty teenager. And then I worked in advertising most of my life. So I was writing copy, technical copy for telecoms clients or books on mindfulness. And I'm, I'm a writer. I doodle I, I'm all, I've always got a pen and pad in my hand, even if I don't ever read back what I've written. And I've always wanted to write a book, but then don't we all? And I put it off <laughs> and put it off because I always had work to do and much more important things to do until we sort of downsized the business and went more into consultancy. So I had more time in my, on my hands. And it was after a long and very loud lunch with friends at a Nigerian restaurant that bears more than a passing resemblance to the restaurant in Booker. I got on the train home and I felt my myself code switch out of Nigerian me into English me I started thinking about my two cultures I started sketching out some characters and I'd written the first scene before I got to my stop and remarkably the first scene in the book is hardly changed from that very rough draft oh my gosh so you wrote it on your phone I had a, I always notepad. have notepads and pens always because I'm a list person so I always have a pad to write the next list Wow, that's crazy. So same menu, same everything. You know, I like that first scene particularly (laughs) because you really show what it's like because even the conversation, the girls were like, this is okay to say in this restaurant, but if you say this outside the restaurant, you'd be in trouble. So it was almost like you had this like private little bubble inside that you created. Friend groups can be like that. I have different friend groups and we have a different private little bubble in each where certain things become shorthand and certain things you get a pass on saying which you wouldn't say outside. And I wanted to recreate that. I think female friendships are just lovely and wonderful and complicated and can be toxic. So what a rich vein to explore. Totally. Oh my gosh. I miss seeing my friends. I feel like I have no time to see my friends. Do you see your friends often? I feel like I never do. Also because I live in the middle of nowhere. So with COVID, it's been a nightmare seeing yeah. friends. Hopefully soon things will change. Yeah. Sometimes I Zoom with them. I'm just yeah. like, <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, I have to say, I really related to a lot of Boo's issues here with her husband and her kids and you know her daughter, I should say, and how she had to navigate, you know, even though he was this charming Frenchman, how he would just, you know, try to make up for everything with a very charming kiss and then run off and do his things. And even the simple things like, like, why can he not look at the calendar? Like it's on the calendar. Why does his work calendar trump my calendar? And, and then what she ends up doing about that ultimately, which I felt like there was a, you know, sort of a, you understood where she ended up 
like what was what the underpinning was for why she made some of her decisions. So tell me about Boo. I love Boo. Uh, Boo is one of my favorite characters. She gets a bit of stick from readers, but I personally think that even the best, most wonderful, most loving mothers, there are times you feel resentful. There are times you feel frustrated. There are times you think, come on, I shouldn't have to do all this or I want more. And Boo has Boo's life is complicated. She never met her father because he abandoned her mother before she was born. And it really didn't help her. her mother had to move back with her parents so she was brought up in a white Yorkshire village in a white family with a white mother white stepfather white siblings and it she never felt like she belonged she felt disconnected from herself and this absent father informed all her opinions about Nigeria about Nigerian men about black men and not in a positive way and then she's tried to adapt all her life to either blend in or fit in or to be accepted and that sense of not belonging is very common when you're mixed race you often feel that you, you you're not sure where you fit in you go there and you're an outsider you come here and you're an outsider and sometimes if you adapt and adapt you can actually get disconnected from who you really are and I think Boo feels that disconnect which means when Isabel scheming manipulative Isabel comes in it's so easy to pull and and push buttons and to insinuate and to persuade Boo to do things that maybe Boo wouldn't have done don't get me wrong Boo's mistakes are her own and she's got to own them but I think being a woman is quite complicated and sometimes if you're fragile and somebody knows just what, what strings to pull you can be set off off the track it's so true, especially with encouragement from your peers and all of that. There were a couple of lines from Boo I just wanted to read just because they're so funny. I know this is just from one of her first chapters. I'll just even start with it. Can I just yeah, read please. the beginning of the chapter? Yeah. The first two paragraphs or something. Boo was pissed off. She slammed a mug into the dishwasher and kicked it shut. An occasional Saturday lunch with the girls wasn't too much to ask. Not even the whole of Saturday. God, no. She wasn't a monster for fuck's sake. Sorry for cursing if any kids are listening. Just a few hours. Enough time to get to Buka, catch up with her best friends whose lives revolved around more than cooking, cleaning, and ferrying, eat food she hadn't made herself, and enjoy a glass of wine. A little time out from being mum, wife, and fucking doormat. But no, how could Didier be expected to remember he'd been booked to look after his daughter for a few hours? How stupid of Boo to assume he might take a cursory glance at the calendar. The one she kept up to date. She'd been ridiculous to expect that much of him. Not when every morning he stood in the exact spot and asked, have you seen my keys? In front of you, moron, she didn't say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it sounds so good when you read it. I want to read that book. <laughs> Oh, thanks. <laughs> and then there's so much of this. Yeah, Boo was having a shitty day. Another shitty day. <laughs> it's so funny. And yeah. I think some of these problems are Gosh. universal. I think all women have these issues or come across these problems. Yes, it's, or they or they don't always no, say them, right? No, no, but flawed characters are so much more interesting than wonderful, perfect people. So even with my friends, I like a bit of spice, a bit of flaw. So I definitely had to have that in my characters. Totally. Yeah, you're right. Wednesdays to Fridays, Boo was a stay-at-home mom, flattened by resentment and bitterness, unappreciated and bored. What do you want, she asked herself. A fucking medal for doing the school run? A round of applause for sorting out a wash? <laughs> Getting Sophia and Didier fed and out of the house this morning had been like herding cats. And you like went on with all the all the stuff. Oh my goodness. <laughs> anyway, I just love her. Okay, so Isabel too. Let's talk about Isabel's backstory as presented in as what happened with Chase and why you how you talked about this sort of controlling abusive relationship. Are we supposed to feel more sympathetic towards her? How did this come about? Tell me about developing her character. Well, Isabel is rich and glamorous, and there are a bunch of people who have ridiculous amounts of wealth, obnoxious amounts of wealth, and it comes with a lot of entitlement. And certainly in Nigeria, you have these people, and sometimes I think the gains are ill-gotten, and I've started to realise we have people like that everywhere. But she comes in with all of these privileges. She's got a chauffeur. She can pay for anything. She can get anything sorted. But she also has to have this vulnerable side so that she can inveigle herself with these characters. So she's got this ex-husband, Chase, who she says treated her terribly 
terribly, making her a battered wife and a victim, and therefore we should feel sorry for her, or so the characters feel. Isabel was a really fun character to write. I'd been watching Killing Eve with Villanelle while I was writing, and it was so, such good fun to have unlimited wardrobe budget to be go, able to go onto Netta <laughs> Porter and pick ridiculous <laughs> clothes, and to have this super confident person who would wear and get away with anything and had access to any restaurants I wanted to go. So she was a really fun character to write. And obviously her backs, her, her reasons for causing all this trouble are what propel the narrative. And it's sort of finding out why is she doing this? Why does she, what is her game is what keeps you turning the pages, hopefully. And her blue fingernails. Didn't you say she had blue nail yes. polish? I love Spot that. It. I was just imagining, I'm like, I'm like, was Nikki in like the manicure place <laughs> looking at nail polishes or something like how did this one come about <laughs> I'm quite low maintenance so I very rarely have a manicure in fact I've only got pink nails today because I've been doing book signings and I want the color to match the book <laughs> but normally oh, I, I but normally it. I've got so it was quite fun inventing this high maintenance life that I really don't have yeah, no, I do not have my nails done. I did interview somebody named Ingrid Fatelli who wrote a whole book about joy. That was in the beginning of my podcast, maybe two or three years ago. And she said, if you look down at pops of color and have like rainbow nail polish, you will automatically feel joyous and happier and have a better day. So I experimented with having every nail a different color for a while. And I guess it kind of worked. And then I was like, this is too it's high, high maintenance. So, and that was nail polish chip. You have to really be on it. <laughs> You know, I was surprised here the way that the, you and the book talk about race and, you know, there were some sort of like inside things where they say to each other, oh, you can't say that. You sound racist yourself and all of that. And so in Boo's section, this is, we're now in chapter 11, you, her daughter says, mama, you look like a black woman with an exclamation mark. And then to a bell, Didier stopped to kiss her. But who are you? And what have you done with my bell? It's like cheating on my wife. So in other words, they're trying to say, she looked so pretty that she all, all, she looked like a black woman, right? Like, so tell me about I this. I think it was more about the hair. So Boo has wavy hair that's sort of not remotely Afro. It could be called white hair, if you like. And so when she puts on this black exploitation Pam Greer Afro, she looks like a transformed character. She looks completely different. And what I wanted to do was play with being mixed race is a complicated thing. And sometimes... It's it's quite, I, I think sometimes it should be almost defined as its race on its own rather than being black or mm -hmm. white. And I think also it, I was interested in how three people with exactly the same racial makeup could feel so differently about their race. But I wanted to explore, you can't have mixed race characters and not touch on colorism, class, race. And I wanted to explore them, but in quite a real way, because Black people, brown people, we can have isms too. We can have prejudices just the same way anyone else does. I didn't set out to solve these problems because if I could, I wouldn't be writing books. I'd be running the, U running the UN. But I wanted to actually say it as it is. You know, the truth is colorism is a real thing. And arguably I've benefited from being light skinned. And I certainly have a totally different experience to a black man or even a black woman, but it's not always a positive thing. There are downsides that come with it too. And I do find that certainly in my experience, mixed race people often clock each other and form a bond because we're the only people who have experienced what we've experienced. It doesn't mean we don't have white friends or black friends. I have both. But often if I meet someone who's Anglo-Nigerian, there's a shared history, a shared connection that only we can understand. And I wanted to explore that without making my characters perfect or without solving the problems. So some of the things Boo says are atrocious, but the truth is we sometimes yeah. say atrocious things. Yeah, I like her lack of filter. I don't know. She It endears her to me. <laughs> so it's like, real. Yes. And then as... The there was this one. Well, actually, I feel like I shouldn't give it away. But the scene with, with the police. You know, I'm gonna just like skip it. And I don't. Sometimes with fiction, I want to go places that are. I feel like maybe I shouldn't bring up. So I think I'll skip it. Okay. So let's go back to character development as a thing. So even with the background of loving to write and all of that, you still made these four women and the other characters, the husbands and the spouses and the the bosses and everybody has their own very clear personality on the page. So do you just naturally know how to do that? Or did you have to take any classes or like, how did you, 
I find that very challenging to do. So how did you do it? I've worked in advertising all my life and I've worked in planning and in copy. And with advertising, there's no detail that is too small. When you've got a 30 second commercial, everything has to be perfect. So there's so much work that goes into the background. I mean, we could do a year's work to shoot 30 seconds. So I'm really about the planning stage. So for e- I had this spreadsheet. It was ridiculous. When I printed it out, it was taller than me. It went through for each character. There were about 100 questions I had to answer. I had to know everything, their inside leg measurement, how old they were when they walked, their favourite colour of lipstick, the first boy they kissed, their favourite record. I mean, things that would never, ever make it into the book, how they'd react if X happened or Y happened. And I kept building this spreadsheet and also making sure that my girls were different, even little things like, do you drink tea or do you drink coffee? Or are you more of a char latte type of person? Which meant I got to know these people so well. Well, I probably know them better than I know myself. And they became real living, walking women, which helped me. It really helped me write the book because I actually knew how they'd all react to any situation. So when I threw all this wahala at them, I knew what they'd do. So when you were doing your spreadsheet and you were answering those questions, did you think, okay, well, maybe I'll have her like tea or, or, or did they come to your head fully formed? Like, oh yeah, oh, obviously. No, it, like tea. it grew and grew. Originally the spreadsheet was only six questions. And then as I start, as I wrote the first draft, I started filling in for them. And it almost felt like the girls were telling me what they were like. I was dreaming of them. If I went shopping and mm-hmm. I saw a girl with a ponytail, I'd try and walk around to see what she looked like because it could be my boo. And I think one of the things a lot of writers do is we're exceptionally nosy we eavesdrop I was on a train to London yesterday and I was supposed to be working and instead of working I was earwigging on these conversations <laughs> behind me because that's how you sort of learn how real people talk and you get that you know real conversation so that your dialogue actually feels real rather than forced I think that might be the biggest difference between novelists and any other kind of writer I we're think, nosy I think or <laughs> no just the, the eavesdropping and what you do with the eavesdropping, right? Like I could, I could eavesdrop, but that would be the end of it versus like eavesdropping and then turning it into an entire narrative in your head and then coming home and like writing about it and turning somebody into a character. And I don't know. I think it's awesome. But I'm more of like, I wonder what that person's doing with that person. Is that a first date? Like, what are they doing together? Maybe they were friends from high school. Oh, I do that as well. (laughs) And the other thing is you never know when ideas are going to strike. So I walk my dogs about 90 minutes every morning and they are now used to me stopping (laughs) stock still and suddenly sending myself a voice message because some thought has popped into my head and they look, it's just, oh, it's just her doing her thing. 90 minute walk oh every morning it's like a routine it's like a thing not very fast this isn't a power walk this is just a amble round that's so great wow that is my dog poor my dog she just I do not walk her (laughs) far enough or long enough I'm like go to the bathroom (laughs) gotta get home (laughs) wow and I read on your Instagram that it's going to be a BBC Show is this that right? Is right. Oh this is. I still pinch myself when anybody says that. I feel a sort of glow and a real. Is did I make this up? But yes, before we before the the publishing deal was announced, I'd already signed with a lady called Liz Kilgariff from Firebird, who's going to produce it, and the BBC have commissioned it. So it's not just an option; it's going to happen. Six parts, one hour on telly and it'll be streamed worldwide so you'll get to watch it and it's going to be phenomenal because when I was writing it I had pictures of actresses for each of my women and they were on a board behind where I write and I'd look up to see I can't tell you who they are now obviously because they're not going to be the real people but I can't wait to see (laughs) who they cast and see if they match my inner imaginings of what they look like. And are you, that's so cool, by the way. So exciting. Are you involved in the adaptation at all? No, or? they did ask, but writing a book is really hard. Writing a script play, definitely above my pay grade. And I've got this amazing script writer. She's called Teresa Ikoko. She's Anglo-Nigerian, so she gets it. She gets all the food references. And she was BAFTA nominated for Rock, so I know she'll do 10 times a better job than I ever could. And I think it's quite nice that it's not my baby. They're being very collaborative. Mm-hmm. They're telling me what's going on, but I can sit at a distance. And if it's awful, I can say nothing to do with me. And if it's wonderful, I'll say I did that. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> That's great. Well, that is so exciting. I can't wait to watch it. Do they even know when it's going to come out or probably They're not They're going to shoot this year. So hopefully it'll be on air next, early next year. Fingers crossed. Oh my I know. gosh. So exciting. 
And you have another book, right? You sold this in a two I book did. deal. So what's up with the next book? Book two is so hard, Zippy. <laughs> if they told me what I knew now, I'd have been one book deal. Because when you're writing your first book, you're just you and your book and your words, no expectation, no, and you don't even know that much about writing. I didn't think about genre or point of view, or you know, you're just writing from the heart. And then suddenly you've got a deadline, a clock going tick tock, tick tock, which obviously makes you freeze and do nothing. And you've got expectation. You've got people saying things about your book, which are mostly lovely, but you haven't really imbued your book with all of this. So suddenly there's the, oh my God, will I be good enough? But I am writing book two. I've got 90,000, not very great words, which I'm pulling into shape. And I do love my story. It's loosely inspired by Jane Austen's Mansfield Park. It's got a mixed race girl in it because I think all my books will have some, I want to reflect myself in literature. I want to read about people like me. She's growing up in Nigeria tragedy strikes and when she's 10 she's moved to her English family at a house called The Ring so brown girl in The Ring and it's going to touch on thorny areas of race and prejudice and class but at its heart it's a love story and a coming of age story and because I quite like an epic twist I think there might be one of those in there. Excellent. Wow. Well, if it makes you feel any better, basically everybody I interview says at the start of any book, they're, they feel the same way. Like, I don't know how I do it. It's not going to work. A lot of people feel the same way, even 20 books in. So Self-doubt is one of the character traits that you need to be a writer. I guess so. Yes. If you are too secure a person, run exactly. the other way. Oh, I don't know what you should be, but you know, <laughs> not this. <laughs> What advice do you have for aspiring authors? Read. Read widely. Read in your genre. Read out of your genre. Read everything you can get your hands on. Read really good books so that you're inspired and so you have this something to aim for. And read really rubbish books so that when you read your work back, you feel good about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any books you read recently? And you don't have to, if you don't have any on top of mind, no worries. But that you have just loved oh, yes. or books that you've always loved or anything well, like that? Well, my favorite ever book is Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. It is just book perfection. The woman is a superstar, a legend, and I've already pre-ordered Sea of Tranquility. I would read her shopping lists. I would read anything that woman writes. But the last book I read is called The Maid by Nita Prose, which only came out two yes. weeks ago and is just shooting up the New York Times bestseller list. So that is a really good book. It's really sweet. The, and the protagonist, Molly Maid, is just such a lovely character. I haven't read it yet, but it's the Good Morning America. Ah, yes, it month, is. I've, yeah. been, I've been meaning to read it and everything. And I don't know, the stacks just tower. <laughs> so many books, so little time. <laughs> Amazing. So like, what's your life like now? What are you going to go off and do? Well, my, li my life is really simple. And I have my two dogs and my husband and I live in Dorset, which is in the middle of nowhere. I look out my window and it's rolling hills. And because this is England, it's usually raining and muddy. So I live in wellies. And the last few weeks have been a whirlwind of going to London, having manicures. And but I, I'm actually quite looking forward to getting back to my normal, nothing happening life, apart from the occasional Nigerian <laughs> lunch with my girl which might just spark another idea but this is dream come Aww. true stuff I mean it really is being a published author is the dream and it's just amazing and, and and the fact that soon hopefully in less than a year I'll be watching I'll be watching a series on telly that will say based on a novel by Nikki May I mean it's it's pinch me stuff I feel like you should write a mass email to every client you had in advertising <laughs> ever just be like, remember me? You probably didn't even know me or I worked on this campaign and blah, blah, blah. And look what I'm doing now. And remember those <laughs> changes you made to my copy? Well, you shouldn't have. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wow. That's awesome. I love it. Well, Nikki, thank you so much. This has been really fun and I can't wait to watch your movie and read your next thank book. Thank you so much, Zippy. I'm now going to go to my bookshelves and I'm inspired. I'm going to rip every book out and rearrange them by color. It, really? It's so beautiful. <laughs> It took me a while, I have to say, because I did this whole room at once and it took me like two days. Oh my gosh, send me a picture when I you're done. I, I want to see. I don't have kids to help and I don't think the dogs will be much use, but I'm going to have to do it. Yeah, do it. Oh my gosh, send me a picture. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for having right. me. Bye. Bye. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. 
Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 